Hello, my name is Dr. Pascal Julie. I'm a consultant at Catanion, a science-driven consulting firm for the biopharma industry. At Catanion, we leverage our science and technology expertise to develop strategies that help our clients drive innovation and bring new treatment to the market. This video is part of the Catanion webinar series. Today, we will talk about the landscape of adeno-associated viruses, AAV-based gene therapy a technology with disruptive potential in the biopharmaceutical industry. I will present to you insight that represents the current status as of September 2021, based exclusively on publicly available information. So, what is the status with AAV? Well, we have three projects that managed to reach the approval stage. The first one was Glibera, which got approved in the AU in 2012. That being said, this product was taken back due to a commercial failure. The second product was Luxturna, which got approval by the FDA in 2017 for retinal dystrophies. And finally, we got in 2019 Solgansma for SMA. So, how does this translate when we look actually at the current clinical pipeline? Well, after a first glance at the pipeline, what you can see is this seems to be loaded by AAV gene therapy. And to understand why is that, we need to look back to 20 years ago, back in 1999. What happened at that time is we had a patient, an 18-year-old patient named Jess Gelsinger, who actually died from the consequences of a gene therapy, at that time treated for OTC with an adenovirus vector. So the whole feeling in the field is, we wanted to move to something which was actually safer. And that's when AAV came into play. So now let's look at the AAV pipeline in more details. So what do we see in the advanced stage? So if you look at the marketed and filed product, you see Zolgansma, Luxturna, Biomarin product. And let's zoom in and focus on what kind of patient we're talking about. Well, we are talking about a narrow range of patient population, so mainly focusing on rare disease. Now, if you look a bit further into that pipeline and move back more into the earlier stage or even phase three, what you see is indications that do not reflect just rare disease, but also focusing on broader indication. You have, for example, AMD that's being developed by Regenix Bio, but you also have in the earlier stage something about Alzheimer, Parkinson, and even potentially diabetes. So what's happening here is that the AV is trying to actually extend from rare disease to a broader wide range of disease and patient to actually touch a really common disease. Okay, so now let's look at two other parameters. The first one being AV clinical trials by start here. The second one being the gene therapy market potential. So first, AV clinical trial by starters. What you see here are signs of a hype. You have a number of trials that in 2010 and 2011 was around eight, seven. Then if you move to 2015, 16, you're actually breaching that barrier of 20 plus clinical trials. And if we look now to where are we currently locating, well, in 2019, 20, or 2020, you are at 40 plus with potential projected for 2021 of 70 plus clinical trials. And that's just for the clinical trials part. Now, let's look at the gene therapy market. So when you look at where we were standing in 2019, you see that we were below 1 billion in terms of cells. Now, if you project to 2026, what you see is we are breaching the 10 billion ceiling. We have projected cells of approximately 13 billion. So clearly there's a lot of uh, bets being placed of those gene therapies being successful. Let's now look at the investor sentiment by focusing on the evolution of market cap of AV companies going back from 2010 to nowadays. So we look at this market cap from a perspective of companies that have at least one AV asset 
from their pipeline. And we are aware of the limitation of this approach. Some companies might also have over focus area. However, we feel this gives a few insights. The first one is from 2010 to 2020, you see a strong evolution of the market cap. Really, I mean, the investors have been really putting money on the table for those kind of companies. Now, the other angle I want to describe here is, and I find it especially interesting, is in the late 2020 slash um, beginning of 2021, we don't see that increase so sharply anymore. What does that mean? And we'll go into the details of that a bit later in this webinar, because this is really connected to the recent news. But there seems to be some doubt um, emerging and some questions um, that came for those type of technologies. If we reflect now on the top deals, what we see is Big Pharma is also heavily involved. We have the acquisition of uh, Spark by Rush for 4.3 billion. We have, for example, also the acquisition of Odentes by Astellas for 3 billion. And okay, so that was already back a couple of years ago. But if we look at just now, September 2021, you still have, for example, this alliance between Regenix Bio and Avi, where Avi already put 370 million up front so on the table. And um, I think it was 1.3 billion in terms of upcoming milestone. So significant money and a strong interest overall. Just looking at the numbers, you would think that AV based gene therapy have a bright future ahead. That being said, the field is actually facing lots of challenges. Those are either technical or commercial. Looking at the technical challenges, you currently have issues concerning the long-term safety, potential for immunogenicity, durability of response, tropism, um, what kind of cells do you want to target, packaging capacity, and how big can the gene that you want to actually fit in be, and also in terms of achieving the right manufacturing um, properties. Also, from the commercial standpoint, you have to think about what is the value of those gene therapy, right? You're talking about game-changing technologies where the promise is not a treatment, it's really a cure for those patients. How do you put a price tag on that? How do you get long-term data? What kind of studies do you need and in which market are you able to achieve this reimbursement? And that's just focusing on the space of AV gene therapy. But if you look also at the competition, you have a bunch of alternative technologies popping up. Those can be, for example, mRNA combined to LNPs, CRISPR LNPs, base editing, also epigenome modulation. You have alternative strategy for deliveries of um, gene therapies. It can be based on extracellular vesicle, either exosome or ARMM but also new and upcoming technologies. Just recently in August 2021 by Feng Zhang and the Sen Technologies. So really you need to consider those aspects and we, what we want to do for the next part of this webinar is to deal further into those details. Let's now look at some of the events that occurred during the year 2019 up to now. So the reality is we had a bunch of uh, horrible news that happened due to safety adverse events connected to the AAV gene therapy trials. Let's take a couple of examples and be more specific. We had Voyager Therapeutics in December 2020, where the FDA actually slapped a hold on their lead gene therapy program over MRI abnormalities. We had Solid Bioscience, which was put on hold in November 2019, and in October 2020, actually the hold was lifted by the FDA. But here, I want to spend a bit of time talking about one company more specifically, is Odentes. So in the recent news, we've seen this month in September 2021, that we now have four patients that actually died while being treated by this AAV gene therapy. Let's try to um, go into a bit deeper and into the context. The first three patients, the first three kids, they have been treated 
which what was one of the highest dose of AAV. We're talking here about 350 trillion viral genome per kilogram in two of those patients. The fourth patient was treated at a lower dose because what we thought was triggering a massive immune response could be prevented by lowering the dose. Now, if we look at this in detail, there are a few parameters to take into account. The first one is the disease. We are talking about the disease where the liver um, status of those patients is actually impaired when you're actually comparing to that of uh, you know, healthy individuals. So those patients might be more sensitive to such an immune reaction. The second point is manufacturing. When you actually inject those AAV into the patient, it's not a perfect product. You might have some AAV that contain, that are actually empty capsid. So that are contributing to the immune response while not providing benefit to the patient. And it's critical that we understand and as well standardize the way we measure and uh, used those type of therapies across the industry when moving forward. Now, why don't we just stop everything? Well, because those patients with those rare conditions, they actually have a limited lifespan. They have really, um, really bad quality of life, um, to, to be really humble. And actually what they need is an improvement. And that's what we've seen with those gene therapy program. In the patient that didn't pass away while being treated, we saw some really clear evidence of clinical benefit into those patients. So therefore, you know, we can't just discard it, the whole thing at once. We need to understand what is happening. Those concerns are not limited to this type of rare disease. If we move to another field, for example, the therapeutic area of ophthalmology, what we've seen for adverum recently for trials in wet AMD is some serious adverse event that resulted in visual impairment of those patients, severe viral impairment. And that was not just in one patient, but five out of 12. So questioning the whole safety around this type of uh, AAV and specifically these vectors. One thing to take away from that is AAV was generally considered safe until we started using 10 times what we ever studied, if not 100 times. So here the dosing is going to get critical. So we've talked about safety as one of the major challenge, but the reality is you have challenges across several dimensions, especially from a scientific standpoint. Now, let's get into that and try to give also some context and how different companies might try to approach those issues. The first challenge that I want to talk about is durability. How long does the effect of those AAV gene therapy last? Well, that has been a concern actually just recently from the FDA. If you look at the biomarine product in hemophilia, because over the year, the factor eight levels were actually observed to be dropping. And that will translate potentially in a loss of clinical benefit for those patients. So there's a concern right there. There was similar concern for Glibera initially back in 2012. Although it's true to say that when you look at Luxtona or Zogensma, so the two FDA approved products, they've been showing more durable response. And we'll get a better grasp around that as the data mature for the overall field of AAV gene therapy. Second challenge, which is potency. So what is the level of protein expression which is required for the clinical impact? How is that relevant? Well, if you look at the recent example, let's take the example of Sarepta. They managed with their construct, which was a macrodastrophin, to actually raise the expression to 28.1%. But the actual clinical benefit that was associated with this increase in expression was not really strong enough versus the placebo performance. So that means we still need to actually improve in terms of the design of the vectors, can be um, the capsid or the transgene expression, there's possibility to work around the promoter sequence, regulatory elements. So all of that is currently a work in progress and will contribute to increased performance. 
immunological barriers. So we've talked in the previous part of this webinar about the issue of the immune response initially. But if you consider that some of those effects might last not forever, you might actually need to go back and re-inject those patients with a second dose of gene therapy. And that means having the possibility to do that. And for that, you need innovative approaches that would allow you to bypass um, the immunity of the um, human immune system. What is currently being worked on is, for example, IgG cleaving and dopeptidase, tolerogenic therapies, such as the one developed by Selecta Bioscience, or other type of modified AAV vectors that are less likely to elicit an immune response. Another challenge for the field, which is tropism and targeting. What have we been good at so far? We've been able to target the eye, the CMS, to some extent the muscle, and the liver. But there's a whole bunch of organs that need to be actually accessed in order to really unlock the full potential of AAV gene therapies. And that's what some companies such as Dino Therapeutics using AI-driven novel cat seed design or specific targeting approach like nanobody enhanced targeting are trying to solve. A major limitation of AAV is also the gene size. How much can you pack into an AAV? Usually people talk about 3KB and some companies are actually trying to develop dual AAV based approach. So you would basically have two of the components of the product that would recombine within the cells. But this comes with its own set of issues. For example, unwanted truncated product. And will you be able to really reach a strong level of expression? Heavy investment is also going into manufacturing. Because as we discussed, what we want is we want to have improvement, standardization, and hopefully this would help solving the issue of empty capsid. Finally, from a regulatory standpoint, the slow uptake pricing and reimbursement comes to the fact that we currently are struggling to actually put a price tag on those gene therapies. All the government and the payers are trying to assess the value added to the patient. And therefore, it takes time. We need to get um, accustomed to those new type of therapies. But still, companies such as Novartis for Zolgensma have been able to provide early access in Europe with their D1 program based on the promise of retroactive rebates in case of failing efficacy over time. So the whole field is actively working on all the specific challenges that are inherent to the initial AV. Big Pharma is committed to AV, but only to a certain extent. Their investment actually shows a degree of diversification into alternative platforms and approaches. And let's look at that through three examples. First one being Takeda. They are doing deals that will allow them for redosing, lowering the dose, improving biodistribution. But at the same time, they are also exploring deals for alternative delivery vehicles and also heavily invested into cell therapy partnership and acquisition. Bayer doing gene augmentation, but also stem cells related deals with Blue Rock Therapeutics connected to iPSCs. You also have allogenetic cell therapies are part of their focus with Atara Biotherapeutics. And gene editing, so a broader range altogether. This is also seen when you look at Novartis, where they have a pipeline which has both gene therapy components, but also cell therapy component, with currently eight clinical programs, 10 being still preclinical on top. We have seen that Big Pharma is investing into different types of technologies to address different indications. So what we need to consider here is actually what is a whole realm of solution and options to affect the protein expression. Well, the first thing that you have to consider when talking about a disease or relevant mutation is, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a loss of function, a gain of function, or both? What are we trying to do with that? 
Are we trying to add back a healthy gene copy? Are we trying to remove the protein or actually put down the level of protein expression? Are we trying to do both at the same time, for example, in the case of a toxic gain of function? Or are we trying to act here as a protein factory? And depending on what you're trying to achieve, then you have different platform available. If you want to reduce protein expression, you might think about going after ASO or siRNA. And if you want to upregulate protein expression, you might want to choose another option. You might want to choose an mRNA strategy, gene addition, which is where AAV would fit in. But you could also leverage other types of technology, like gene editing, going for um, CRISPR-Cas9, or even think about epigenome editing. And additional parameters need to be considered depending on how you want to approach the targeted tissue. Do you want to go from other type of viral vectors or do you want to go for non-viral strategies? Finally, one issue is also administration. Do you not need to go local, systemic? And do you need an additional strategy for immunosuppression such as plasmamerasis? So all of those questions will pop up and this is why Big Pharma is actually diversifying their investment. That means AAV is a piece of the puzzle and not the entire solution. And people need to also focus on the emerging alternative technologies around that. What have we learned in this webinar? We've seen that AAV is the leading vector for the in vivo gene therapy, especially in clinical development. Now, if there's one thing we've learned from the development from the recent years is AV is at the same time facing multiple limitations, immunological barriers, potency, durability, size, tropism, and at the center of all this was concern from a safety standpoint that actually ask the questions, how far will you be able to go with the AV based technology will you be able to make this transition from the rare disease space to the bigger space of more common disease. We have a multitude of technologies, either viral or non-viral, that can support the delivery and also other platform for transient protein expression. And all of those technologies can also contribute to actually bring improvement to the patient in those conditions. So, AV will remain at the forefront for the upcoming years. That being said, there's also a scenario in which other technology platform will actually displace AAV in the years to come and AV will only remain centered at the rare disease level. That concludes today's Catalan webinar. Thank you for watching. Check out our other webinars and publication on our YouTube channel and website. Follow us on LinkedIn for our latest update and send us an email if you want to get in touch with us. See you next time.